Let me give you some backgrounds. Uh, when I've told people that, or when Aubrey and I have talked to people that told them we're going to the Congo, to the DRC, um, one of the first questions we get is, where is that? Um, it's the second largest country in Africa. It's uh, right in the middle, right in the heart, and um, has one of the most intriguing and um, tumultuous histories. Um, you know, colonialism in Africa was bad everywhere, but it was particularly awful in DR Congo. Um, King Leopold of Belgium claimed Congo as his private property and basically extracted it for, for rubber and uh, ivory and they'd go in and just ransack villages and uh, put all the women and children in a room and tell the men that you know their families lives depended on their rubber quotas um, just awful 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 stuff um, eventually became a after international pressure made him hand it over to the actual government of belgium things got a little better but um, still really bad. In the 60s, uh, just like everywhere else, rapid decolonization left a country really unsuitable to run itself, an economy based on extracting resources rather than developing wealth for itself. Um, their first leader, um, Mobutu, you've probably seen him with the leopard print hat, hosted the rumble in the jungle. Um, not, a, not a good guy. Um, just seems like person after person comes in to lead the country and just uh, um, gets worse and worse. The 1994 Rwandan genocide that most of you are probably familiar with, if you've seen Hotel Rwanda, um, details that. But that spilled over into Eastern Congo and started what, uh, what most people have called Africa's World War, the First and Second Congo Wars from like 1996 to 2003. Um, Five million uh, died as a direct result. I mean, if you've, number probably sounds familiar, very similar to, to the number um, in the Holocaust. Um, but, um, you know, I, the world kind of turned a blind eye to it. It's so removed. Um, and this is, this is the context where uh, Dr. Kasali is beginning. You know, especially in the aftermath of the war, you have these rival rebel groups that um, learn that it's very profitable to pillage and to kind of run this underground mine trade um, and it just uh, it's a culture that thrives on fear and on just the taking advantage of existing structures to you know try to survive in a failed economy um, very very sad and, and very bleak and you still feel that um, when you're when you're walking around the streets of Benny um, the way that it was told to me by an, another American who's there is, they said, everybody's lost somebody. Um, in, in the city itself, where we'll be, you know, the, the largest UN peacekeeping force in history right now is stationed in Benny. Very safe in the city. Um, but everybody's lost somebody. It's, it's a struggle at a national level that um, nobody has been able to um, escape from. Very sad. Uh, and also very, very hopeful for what Congo Initiative has been able to do and um, what Aubrey and I are going to be able to um, minister to them and, and be a blessing to, to their ministry. Well, uh, let me tell you a little bit about us. Uh, well, let me, there's Benny in the northeastern DRC, right across the border from Uganda. Um, when we go there, we fly into Kampala, Uganda, and, and, and drive. It's about eight hours. Um, Aubrey and I have wanted to do international ministry for a long time, we, uh, even before we met each other. Um, didn't really know in what um, capacity. I think I envisioned myself as the next Jim Elliot who was going to go into some village and tell everybody about Jesus, and they were going to make a movie about me. Um, I was here at Beeson that the idea of theological education um, in the developing world context, in the majority world context, um, for, really heard that for the first time. Um, there's a, there's a Beeson alum named Seth Terror who worked in um, Argentina and then now Colombia, I believe, um, who came and gave a talk to this effect, just talking about the need, the need for theological education in the, in the majority world. And I actually emailed him and stole this graph from him. Um, it's from a book called The Next Christendom. And if you look and see where the, the church is growing, 
um, and projected where the church will be in 2050, um, it's very different. You know, the global, the global south is where the church is growing, and yet the um, theological education resources there are minimal. Um, it's hard to find statistics on these things just because we don't know. I mean, so much of so much of what's going on in the church is not, you know, there for here, us here in the West to see. But um, it, it's a problem, uh, the amount of pastors that just are not, are not prepared, whether it be just a, a formal theological education or even just discipleship um, trained in how to, how to read the Bible well, how to teach and preach well. Um, and that caught, that caught fire for me. Um, Aubrey's always wanted to um, teach uh, primary school in a, in a uh, majority world context and um, kind of think about how we should do education at that age. So we started calling missions agencies and saying, hey, um, do you uh, talk, talk to us about the way that you view um, theological education uh, in the developing world and, and primary education and are, and are there places um, where we could be, be there and do those things. We didn't have a particular part of the world that we wanted to go. And we called a lot, a lot talked to a lot of Gord organizations, and it was um, United World Mission that, that really caught us. And um, I think what it was about their vision that was so contagious was their commitment to partner with pre-existing local organizations. Um, we're going to the Congo, and all of our bosses will be Congolese. And we really wanted that to be the case. Um, United World Mission, where they, where they work all over the world, but that, that's one of their commitments is, yes, we're going to be your American sending agency, and we're going to take care of you. We're going to check up on you. We're going to require that you go to these retreats and these conferences, and we're going to um, support you and give you spiritual formation training and intercultural training. And, um, but as far as the on-the-ground logistics of what you'll be doing, we want you to be under somebody there. Uh, who knows the context. Um, so they seek out partnerships, and um, we loved that model. So we, we looked at different places with them, and you know, I think the DRC is probably the last place in the world we would have picked. Um, we had a Skype interview with um, a couple that uh, had, had been in there in Vinny, and um, just kind of to check it off the list. And we hung up Skype and looked at each other and said, let's go to, the, let's go to Africa. Um, the, the vision was contagious. I mean, as you see, just watching Dr. Casale talk, I mean, when you're in the same room as this guy, it's just impossible to be sad. I mean, he's just like, he laughs. He, he, they had us over for dinner, and I feel like he just laughed the whole time. Just story after story, just filled with the joy of the Lord. So, what an awesome guy. And it was, it was so easy to catch the vision for what they were doing. And like you said, in the vacuum of a place like um, Benny, where so many things are going wrong, um, a place like uh, UCBC, the University. All right, is Colton here? I need French help. <laughs> Université Chrétienne belongs to Congo, I think. Uh, Christian Bilingual University of the Congo um, has been able to make such a huge splash. Um, and I want to I talk to you guys a little bit about uh, what they've been able to do. Here's here's downtown Benny. So this is what you know. You know, we get on we get on Google Image and type in Benny Congo, and there's you know, about two pictures of the city and a whole bunch of pictures of people with guns. Um, Aubrey took this picture. We were very careful when we were there to take pictures because we don't want to be remembered as the, uh, as the Mazungus that take all the pictures when we come back. Um, but just a lovely town. We love the people. Um, here's, here are David and Casuera Casali. Uh, uh, they're, they're both from the DRC, from uh, just north of Benny, where we'll be. Um, got his master's, his, his MDiv from Next in Nairobi, and then came to Trinity in Deerfield, um, Trinity University. To, he got his PhD with D.A. Carson in New Testament, and uh, came back and was working at Next when he heard from a missionary friend in the Congo. Um, this is right at the start of the, of the first war, when things were really getting, getting dicey in eastern Congo. He heard from a missionary a friend there who said that people were coming to him and saying, well, this is, this is great that you're bringing us these Bibles, but will you tell us whether we can take up machetes and guns and defend, uh, defend our wives and children from these militias? Um, we don't, the, the pastors here do not, know, a lot of times churches are going to war against other churches because of ethnic 
reasons, because of political reasons. Um, just what do we do? Um, Dr. Kasali, I think, saw that there was a crisis of leadership in the church in Congo and wanted to, wanted to do something about it. Um, went back to the States, raised money. A guy named Cullen Rogers Gates in North Carolina, a friend for him from, um, from the States, uh, talked, and they started what's called the C Congo Initiative. And this is, I told the UWN partners with groups that are there, Congo Initiative is going to be um, the group Aubrey and I will be with. And um, their fantastic vision, an amazing plan of, of uh, really reaching the area. You are already seeing the, the effects. They started university, UCBC. Um, five faculties of applied sciences, economics, communications, arts, and theology. Um, all with the vision of having um, training, up, training up the next generations of, of leaders in the, in the Congo. Um, he saw so many of the problems regarding infrastructure, regarding communications. Um, what were they, they needed people that were educated well and that had the vision of, um, you know, of uh, Jesus' kingdom come and wanted to use their gifts to um, to bring the gospel, to bring peace to a, a war-torn uh, nation, a, a war-torn area. Um, UCBC is a, a wonderful place. I mean, we, uh, we were there for just uh, two days on campus. We got to see some classes going on, get a, a tour of the place, and it's been there since 2007, I believe, 2008. Um, right now, it's like at 500-something students, uh, 60 in the theology department. Um, just a, the, the attitude, just the, the passion from every single administrator and every student was amazing. I, they believed that they were somewhere that was going to um, effect an enormous change for, for their country. And um, from talking with alum, uh, it sounds like it already has. I mean, as employers in Benny, if they have a choice between a UCBC grad and somebody else, it's easy. And the UCBC grads are the ones that show up on time and work hard and make friends with their employees and go above and beyond. And um, really, really special what, uh, what, what Dr. Casali and, and Congo Initiative's vision has been able to do. Um, of the 60 theology students, most of them want to be pastors or counselors. A lot of them already are pastors or, or counselors and are coming back. Um, Biblical literacy is very, very low, even for pastors. Um, it's, not, it's not a reading culture, and I'll talk about this more when I talk about the school where Aubrey is going to teach. Um, it's a literate culture. Just about everybody can uh, read the news or read a menu, can write, can write simple sentences, but there's not, like the, there's not a lot of books in Benny. Um, so, I mean, students show up at the university and they don't know how to read very well, um, which makes it really hard to be a you know, a, a high-level academic institution that, with the power to influence the culture when, uh, as I saw, I mean, as, uh, could, could you all imagine your degree without books? I mean, I, I talked to students that said, like, we just didn't read very much in our classes. And um, Dr. Casali hinted to this, the traditional educational model in the DRC is very, very much, I'm the professor, I'm going to tell you a bunch of things, and on the test you're going to tell them back to me. Um, <laughs> Dr. Casale said that he had heard a visiting professor say to him, or say to his students during an exam, give me back my beautiful words. <laughs> um, I mean, Casale coming to, coming to Trinity and, and, and seeing the model of education at, uh, there, he said, wow, this is something we could really use. Um, of course, wanting to do it in a very Congolese way, not gr um, ripping something out of a Western context and plopping it in the middle of Africa, but, um, really wanted to see that change and I mean that, that that's why he's looking for people like me um, who have been through an education system in America who can kind of set some trends and start the culture of education that hopefully the Congolese um, professors and um, administrators who know their context far better than I do can can pick up on that and um, have a more more inductive learning by doing um, conversational, interactive type of education that um, you know we we enjoy here at uh, at Beeson and other schools here in the West. Uh, Congo is very under academized. Uh, I, I, I looked all over to see if I could find this in writing somewhere. Um, one of the administrators told us there was less than a hundred PhDs in the nation. Uh, this is 80 million people in the Congo. There's just no. It's just there's no. There's very few universities even. Um, so creating a culture that is um, academically astute and able to 
um, really hit with the big boys as far as in education in Africa is a difficult thing just because nobody knows what it looks like. Um, which is why they've had uh, you know, American um, and uh, European professors come in and help to this point. I mean, um, just to I mean, pro provide something and there's a vacuum there. It needs to be, needs to be filled. It's almost all traveling professors. Uh, I was talking with uh, Dr. Parks about this over lunch and just that this is how a lot of theological education operates in the majority world. There's just not a lot of long-term profess long professors that are there. Um, come in, pop into a three-week module, and then get out, which, of course, you lose the relational aspect that we have here at Beeson, where we get to know our professors really well. Um, and you just you don't have course options, right? If a student starts at this time, you're pretty much going to take this and this. Oh, good, your elective is on the book of John. Enjoy it. Um, if you have long-term professors, there's a lot more you can do. You have a lot more flexibility. Um, they have an amazing resources in terms of like a library. I was very impressed, but just not not the not not the culture there yet where you can utilize it. But 90% of the books have never been opened, and um, hopefully that's something that um, as as the university develops and um, and uh, Dr. Casale is able to put together a, a faculty that um, you know that'll change in the future. In the future, it's a one. It's amazing to see what uh, I mean. This this place in 30 years. Um, it's going to be something phenomenal. I mean, it already is, um, but I, I can't can't wait to, to see it. All right, let's um, let's go about ten years younger. Um, talk about what what's happening with eight year olds in Benny. Um, this is the Académie Belong de Congo, um, ABC or ABC. This is where Aubrey will teach. It is um, a bilingual primary school. That is, is eventual goal is to train, um, just to bring their students to UCBC with um, a lot more background knowledge of how to read well and how to think and um, basically extend the ceiling of the university by extending the education of, of people that are coming in. Of course, that's many years off from now. And right now, this is just a uh, <laughs> one little room uh, right off the main road in Benny. Um, but eventually, it'll be on the campus of UCBC. And um, the, the idea of influencing the influencers, just like UCBC is. Um, let's change the culture by um, influencing the people that have power, influencing the people that have the money and the resources to do things. Um, Aubrey will have um, a couple of uh, kids of other expatriates, um, some kids of some wealthy um, Ugandans that are in, in the city, but that are invested in, in Benny. And then a handful, um, probably half the school of scholar, a lot, largely scholarshiped um, Congolese uh, Bini children that um, are really receiving an education that is um, superior to really anything else you can get in the region. Uh, first of all, learning English is just an enormously, enormously valuable. Um, I found from a um, Canadian journal study that surveyed the uh, just the academic literature uh, worldwide, and they found that 45 percent of scholarly literature is in English, to where 4 percent is in French. Um, by lear learning, if, if you're trying to build an academic institution with the power to change a culture, knowing English is important. Um, and there was no shying away from that in their in their minds. Um, no no shame in saying that. And that's why I, I think they're they're kind of excited about having me. They were salivating over Aubrey coming uh, from the from the beginning. Uh, it's hard not to get my feelings hurt, but she's awesome. I can handle that. Um, they're they're really excited to have Aubrey teaching at at ABC, and I, I think she'll she'll jump right in and, and really, really enjoy it. And this is, I mean, uh, the, the goal, I think, of, of ABC is to change the culture from a, um, from a literate culture to a literary culture. Um, you know, let's, what, what, what would it look like if, if reading was um, not just a means to an end, but if we were to teach these, these children to love to learn and love to learn through, through reading. Um, let me run through a, a couple other ministries that CI does, the Congo Initiative does, and then I'll, I want to tie them all together and, and make a few statements about um, this ministry as a whole. Uh, this is Papa Daniel. Uh, he prayed for us at the end of our meeting, and um, Aubrey leaned over to him and asked him if he could come and pray for us every morning before we go on with our day. Um, just the, the, kind of, the kind of guy you can tell has been through a lot and that the Lord has sustained him through a lot and um, is a, a mighty, mighty man because of it. 
Um, he started an organization called A, and that's O-E-I-L. French is ridiculous. Um, it's the word for I. It's an, it's an acronym. Um, it's, uh, the idea behind it is reconciliation ministry um, in, in these war-torn areas. They go out from Benny to the places where the war is raging on even now, to where farmers are being driven off their fields and um, villages are being ransacked, this kind of, this kind of out, out, in, the, out in the bush DRC. Um, and they do um, pastor training uh, seminars in Swahili and French. They do um, children's ministry like... I guess our equivalent of a vacation Bible school type things. They do um, like medical clinic type stuff. Now he, he was talking about a hospital that they built during the war and they left and when they came back to it, it had been like just destroyed. Um, these, these kind of things happen. Things change quickly and there, there needs to be uh, feet on the ground going out and bringing the good news of, um, of the resurrection to a, uh, um, places that need hope. And such a such a joy to hear him talk about that. Um, I, I, of course, this is the kind of thing that I'm passionate about and would love to be a part of if I can learn some French and Swahili. Hopefully, hopefully in the future that will be the case. And then uh, one more ministry I want to tell you about. Uh, La Charité is another primary school started by C. I actually started by Casuera Casali, Dr. Casali's wife. Um, who got her at the same time that uh, Dr. Saul was working at Trinity. She got her PhD in Christian education from Trinity International University and uh, came back and was working with some women in the area, some, some either abused or um, former prostitutes that were at the end of the road and looking for job skills. They provided things like teaching them how to sew and um, just life skills type things and ask, asking, what, what can we do for you? They said, well, we can't afford the public school fees for our children. So I'm like, $30 a year, they can't scrounge up for their kids to go to school. So um, La Charité was born, a almost free, almost is on purpose. They want, they want investment at the part of the parents. Um, on almost free um, education for their, for their children. And it is, I mean, this, I, I wish I could, I could turn, turn the picture on and show you the room, a room about as big as this stage that they'll put like 35 first graders in. Um, but from their stories, it sounds like the kids are just so amazed that they get to go to school, that they're all like little angels. They just sit there motionless and listen. Um, Aubrey says, I, I can, I'll sign up, sign up for that. Um, I, I don't know, uh, her involvement with this right off the bat will depend on her French. Um, proficiency and how quick she can pick that up. There's also opportunities for teaching English there as well. Um, but the reason I bring up these four is because I think that we can learn a lesson from um, Congo Initiative um, with regards to where is it that we do our ministry, at the top or the bottom? Do we influence the influencers? Do we go after those that have power um, and those that can change things? Or do we go grassroots? Do we um, minister to those who are not otherwise going to be ministered to? Do we um, find the ones who no one else is talking to and, and train them and teach them and uh, meet their needs? And I think Congo Initiative is able to answer yes. Um, they do both. And the two things integrate together very well. Um, I think this is something that could be the case in your local church as well as in Congo. Um, I think this is how a culture has changed from the top and from the bottom. And I think we're seeing it happen in, in Benny, which is awesome. Um, yeah, it's, it's so encouraging to see and, and, and so exciting. Um, this is the new building that they're, uh, this is where probably I, I will be teaching. Um, but uh, let me ask uh, three things of you guys um, as I finish here, and then I'll, I'll take some, some questions if you have them. Um, first of all, pray for Aubrey and I. This is a big transition for us. Um, it's a very different place, and we love it, and we can't wait to go back, but this will be a, a difficult season of support raising while I, uh, right now I'm teaching full-time at, uh, teaching math and physics at a high school. Uh, I, I meant to say right when I came up here, it's really nice to look out over a room of people that don't hate me. Um, it's tough, it's tough, tough to raise support and to do what needs to be done with that at the same time as grading papers. And I mean, it's been a blessing and the Lord's shown me so much, but this is, this is a, this is a tricky time 
and Aubrey's working hard um, at, uh, she, she teaches um, third, fourth, and fifth graders in math and reading with uh, a ministry of independent press. Um, and um, there's a lot for us to do, and it's going to be overwhelming, and the transition of learning a language and getting there is going to be a lot. So I would, I would you know, say with you guys as my family over the last four years to, to pray for us and um, encourage us and check in on us and see how we're doing, and we love that. Um, second thing I'd say is to consider the academic needs of the global church. Um, I know many of you, and um, those of you that I don't know, um, there's Beeson, Beeson students um, get passionate about things, I have, I have, consistent things that I've seen, and uh, the, the academy and um, just um, theological academia is one of them, and that's an awesome thing, and don't let anybody ever tell you that it's not. Um, I'd ask you to consider, to pray through um, where that would be, and to not make assumptions about that. Um, there are major needs um, all over the world in this regard, and... Um, I mean, I don't know, it's, this isn't something you have to convince me about. This just seems fun on so many levels. And this, this is kind of thing that, as we were researching, I just, I can't believe I get to do this for a living. This is amazing. Um, but, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really viable use of, of, of your gifts and a really special thing. And uh, whether it be long-term or short-term, I mean, you know, this, right, right now, this whole, this whole deal a lot of times thrives on um, teaching of modules. A lot of times from people that have their, and we're not, we're not going and, save, and saving the world in a, in, in a way. I mean, we have resources here that not everybody has. And there's no shame in admitting that. That here in the 21st century America, I mean, there are things at our fingertips, especially when we have an education like this, that not everybody has that blessing. And it makes sense to go share it, doesn't it? Um, so uh, I mean, look into that. Find, find ways for your churches to get involved in this kind of ministry. Um, I think it's a special thing that, that's often overlooked. Uh, uh, and th the third thing I'd, I'd ask you to do is, is to uh, look at Congo Initiative. You know, what you've heard now, get on their website. There's, there's some things to be learned from this, one of which being the top, from both from the top down and from the grassroots up that I, uh, that I talked about. But uh, another thing about Congo Initiative I think is very important that I want to impress on you guys was from a conversation I was having with, or we were having with, uh, Dr. Casali in his office. Um, in his little, little tiny off, dust, dusty office in the corner of UCBC, such a, a happy place full of, uh, you know, posters and, and, and uh, happy wall art and uh, piles of books and smiling Dr. Casale looking at us, telling us about all the amazing things that God was doing in DRC uh, through Congo Initiative, through UCBC, through ABC and La Charité, just going on and on. And um, about how he'd, how he'd love to have us and how our gifts seem to fit so well. And then he looked at Aubrey and I and said, we don't need you. We don't need you. The Lord is doing amazing things here in the Congo. We don't need you. But we'd love to have you. We'd love for you to come work with us. Um, that's who you want to work for. Um, you don't want to be in a position where you're needed. Um, you want to be in a position where um, the Holy Spirit is um, relied upon and uh, Jesus is followed and God is glorified. And um, find a, I mean, whether, whether it be here or there or wherever, uh, f find a place where that's the case, um, where you get to use the gifts that God has given you to serve his church um, for his glory. And um, Congo Initiative does that. I mean, they're, they're more than happy to use our um, resources from here in the West that they don't have, but... Um, it's a Congolese ministry because it's in the Congo. And um, Aubrey and I go there with much humility with regards to that. Um, I've never, I've, I've spent one week of my life in the DRC. Last thing I'm going to do is show up and tell them how to do church. Um, but um, our both, both Aubrey and I, our goal is to start to go there and to be faithful to what um, the Lord has gifted us and to uh, um, hopefully um, be used by God to affect some change in a, in a hurting place. Um, thank you guys so much. It's so good to see you. Yeah, the question is on timeline. Um, July, if we can have our support raised, Lord willing, we'll go to six weeks of training with United World Mission, six weeks of, um, uh, it's, it's called CIT. Um, it's, um, I don't remember what the acronym stands for, but it's like a cross-cultural, a lot of mission agencies use it. 
um, and uh, tra training on language learning, training on, you know, just here's all the buffoonish mistakes that Westerners make when they go to X place and don't do that. Um, and there's a short spiritual formation retreat at the end of that. And uh, after that, language school, which could be anywhere from Senegal to France to Quebec, we don't know yet, um, probably uh, four to six months. So that would put us in, I mean, if, if everything goes according to plan, which things always do, right? Um, that will put us there about this time next year, a little later. I was also, <laughs> confident on that, um, there's supposed to be elections in the Congo in um, uh, October, November, but uh, uh, Kabila, the president, has conveniently decided recently that the nation cannot afford elections. Um, so there's a number of things that could happen here, some of them bad. Um, so we'll also be keeping an eye on stability and making sure that, uh, that it's, it's going to be a good time for us to go in and not have to evacuate three weeks after we get there. Mm -hmm. Yes, Stephen. Um, we will not. It's an interdenomination. Uh, CI is, is um, ecumenical on purpose. There's everything. There's, there's one major denomination in the Eastern Congo that was started by Baptist missionaries um, in the 50s, and um, a lot of it tends to be that. Um, but then there's, there's, um, and there's everything from there's Presbyterian churches there. There's, um, there, there are Catholic students in the theology department at uh, UCBC. Right? It's, it's very, very ecumenical. Orthodox and ecumenical. Yes? Um, what do you mean by yeah, um, I, I'll probably be working in more of the Bib studies, um, languages and um, Old and New Testaments. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm open to branching out into the more theological or um, historical stuff, but I don't think I'm, I'd have to work a lot harder. Um, but we'll see. Um, you know, it's, it'll depend on their needs and what uh, they think I'm able to do. I mean, I don't really know what I'm qualified to do, to be honest. I feel like I feel like Beeson throws you a little bit in a whole bunch of different directions. And um, you know, as as I as I prepare, I'm sure I'll learn and teach a module and say, I'm "Not doing that again." And teach another one. Say, "That was awesome. Let's do that." So, I mean, well, yeah, we'll see. I think there's a lot of flexibility there. Yes, Yannick. Um, in, in theology, yes. Um, now, the curriculum-wise, you would look at the uh, you'd look at the course schedule and say that looks like Beeson. Um, there's just not, I mean, there's not the expectation like there is here that pastors are going to be able to go and get a master's degree. So, it's you know, it, it really does. Like I, I looked at the degree plan, it looks remarkably similar to here. Um, I mean, it's, yeah, knowing Dr. Sully, it might be exactly what they have at Trinity's MDiv. I mean, because it's probably something similar to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Ryan, so maybe for you in this context, and then in general for theological education and the majority world, um, what do people who aren't going out in the world, what do you think the, how can the church here serve? And how can we, like, theology can. Oh, of course. In the church, what role do we play in this? Yeah, the, the question is about how. Um, just a, a a local church here in here in Birmingham, Alabama, can be involved in the more academic um, mission. Um, and I don't know. I, I'll probably take some creativity. I think um, awareness is a big thing. And just realizing that wow, training a pastor is really is important. It's something that you all believe, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, I think that a lot of times there's. I mean, I, I've gotten like legitimate before people saying, "Well, is that really the most important thing we need to be doing?" Um, and um, I think some just general understanding of here's why this is important. Um, I mean, of course, there's always ways to get financially involved. Um, I would say, like, just most, most pastors that have had a, you know, a good theological education, even some that haven't, I think would be qualified to teach in a lot of contexts. I'm, like, my th 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 things are a little bit different scale-wise. Like, my, my MDiv, my Master's of Divinity, holds a lot more um, clout to it in, in, in a place where there's only 100 PhDs, um, you know, as it does here. So I, I think I think there's more opportunities, um, and possibly even lay opportunities than people think. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think awareness is big, and as far as beyond that, it might take some creativity. And I'm thinking through. That's a really good question, Dustin. Yeah, Ryan. Sure. For your fundraising. So, uh, as you're raising money now, you're going to be gone for, I'm assuming, one to three years at a time. 
Yes, uh, the term, the, our term will probably be in the three-year range, so two to three-year so range. Yeah, it's it's exactly that. Both of those things. Um, this is going to vary from agency to agency. Um, for for United World Mission, they give you an outgoing support schedule and a monthly support schedule, and you raise both. Um, now, I mean, as soon as I mean, as we as we have people pledging to support us monthly, we're asking them to start now, uh, and that starts going towards our outgoing. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of those things would would vary from agency to agency, but I, I would imagine that, that was somewhat standard. Good question. Yeah, Stephen. No, you're good. Uh, for the money that you raise, will that completely support you and Aubrey while you're in Congo, or will you have to also get paid by working with us? We will not. We, we will be taking zero money from the university. Um, there's just so little financial resources there that even the, the students' uh, tuitions are minuscule. Um, uh, yeah, it, it'll be it'll be for us to live and eat and drive around and get there and get back and yep <laughs> yeah good question yes Yannick. in terms of teaching um, that's a really good question was it, was it, um, he asked what's the uh, biggest challenge in terms of teaching when I get there. Um, um, Dr. Parks was telling me today that I need to get very good at waiting for long, awkward silences for students to answer. In the, in the type of academic environment where it's the professor that gets up there and talks and the students listen, if they're used to that, you know, it's hard to have an interactive class when, you know, that's, that, that's a two-way street. It's got to it's gotta happen on both sides. Um, yeah, and I, I think that'll be tough to, to kind of learn to manage the classroom in a way that facilitates, um, facilitates that kind of discussion. I mean, also, I mean, I just, I, I can't imagine how many um, underlying assumptions based on culture, first of all, that I have, and also that they have. And I mean, that'll be a constant um, kind of figuring out you know, we, we come from very different con contexts, and thus we have a lot to learn from each other. And that I'm sure that'll be a blessing for both me and for them, and, and for Aubrey teaching. I mean, this, it won't be any different teaching fourth graders. Um, just different underlying assumptions and different um, ways of thinking about different theological assumptions coming from these different backgrounds that are probably different than anything you would find here. Um, yeah, I hate to give you such a catch-all answer, but... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'll have lots of answers for that about a month in. Yeah. Yes, Joel. How, what are the numbers? Uh, how costly is it on a month-to-month -month basis? Um, for, for me? Yeah. Well, yeah, how much are we raising? Yeah. Is that awkward for me to say, Dr. Parks, or is that good? I think, I think we should – that'd be a great private conversation. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good question, though. Yes. Very good question. Anywhere from just, I guess, normal college age, 19-year-olds to 30, 40, 50-year-olds that have been pastors and are coming back for education. Yeah, very wide range. I think more younger. Yes. Yes.
Yes. The, the question is, is, is there kind of anti-intellectualism uh, sentiments in the church? And um, I don't really know. Um, I would imagine certainly not with my students. I mean, I, it's, from what I've got in the field, it's very excited, very, very eager to learn what the professors there um, bring. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know about the, um, the average Congolese guy or gal, what their, what their thoughts on of the places, of something like a theology degree from UCBC is. Yeah, I don't know. Yes, Ryan. All right, we'll live um, either, I guess, uh, either by ourselves or with someone else. Um, probably in a bigger house. Probably a, m most of the houses in, in like the more secure areas are, will have you know, two, two, three bedrooms. Um, so we'll either live with another expatriate couple that are there um, or uh, have space to be able to house visiting professors and visiting groups. Um, it's actually um, a challenge for us is uh, Congo Initiative's standards for our um, living are a lot higher than we would choose for ourselves, if that makes sense, it was in regards to safety, which, I mean, you know, I guess I was there for one week, and I probably can't make assessments about how safe it is to be there. Um, but we felt very safe the whole time. I mean, we, we were never worried. Um, a lot of houses, not, not just international folks, so a lot of houses in many have walls, um, just like a walled compound, and they want us to be in a place with a wall, to which, you know, on, that, on our phone conversation, I'll be like, a wall? I don't want a wall. Who has a wall? Um, but, you know, this is the kind of thing to where we learn to trust. We learn to trust the leadership there and trust that they're going to take good care of us, right? It would not be a good thing for Congo Initiative or UCBC if we got hacked to death. It wouldn't be good. Um, and we don't really want that either. But, um, I mean, it's the kind of thing to where we might, um, we might think, well, we could do this, but, you know, we, we trust the Congolese. This is what we signed up for, to have a, have a Congolese boss. And we, we, we trust them on those kind of things. Yeah. Yes. What are the other expatriates? Very few. Um, the, um, we learned the, uh, the Swahili word for white person is mazungu, and we learned that word really quick. And we'd be walking down the, the street, and the children would say, hey, mama, mama, mazungu. Um, but, like, we, yeah, we, we met, like, all eight mazungus in <laughs> Benny. This is like a city of like a half a million people in the area. And it's, uh, so not a lot. Um, there, there are some, uh, the, the, the UN, keep, UN peacekeeping force is mostly Nepalese. Wouldn't have, wouldn't have guessed that. Um, but I mean, lots of people. I don't know the numbers, but I mean, you know, the largest, largest UN peacekeeping force in history. Also, interesting, um, against um, M23. Does that ring a bell? I don't know. Uh, there's a, a big rebel group, very active in Uganda and Congo, and um, when when the UN and Benny was asked to go and silence that rebellion, it was the only time in history the UN has ever been giving an offensive order. UN is very fi fire when fired upon. Very, this is the only time that the UN's ever had a, an, an a offensive military operation. Very interesting. Yeah. The question is, can I get mail? And the answer is no. There is no postal service. The road that we traveled to get um, to Benny from Uganda is the only safe way in right now. It's the only secure road. You can go. There's roads going in all directions, but a lot of a lot of areas that are kind of um, a lot of a lot of rebel groups stationed, and you know, it's just be a bad place to be. Um, that's the only road, and it's about. 40, 30, 40 kilometers, and it took us two hours. It's just, it's a disaster of a road. I mean, like, painful, painful, painful potholes hit, hitting my head against the ceiling. And as I'm, you know, being slowly beaten to death on our drive to Benny, I'm thinking, you know what? Everything that comes into this city comes on this road. That's amazing. We saw an overturned semi-truck, like, leaning against the jungle. It was just odd. Um, yeah, uh, no postal service, which makes us very sad because we'd be very happy to receive care packages from all of you. Send, send the Cheez-Its and Dr. Pepper. Yeah. But no, no post service. We will have, sorry, we will have uh, data on our phones. So emailing and Skyping and stuff like that will be really easy. Thank God it's 2015, 16. Wow. <laughs>